welcome to another of our free YouTube financial modeling tutorials. This time around, we're going to be going through the concept of a leveraged buyout, an LBO, an LBO model, how it works. And specifically, we're going to be addressing one of the most common analogies used to explain an LBO, which is, as I see right here, buying a house with a down payment and a mortgage. And the basic idea there is that a lot of people use this analogy and say that an LBO is just like when you buy a house, because when you buy a company in a leveraged buyout, you use a combination of equity, in other words, cash that the private equity firm has on hand, and then debt that they raise to put toward the purchase price. And then over time, they pay off the debt, and then eventually they sell the company at the end, repay the debt, and then the proceeds after they repay the debt are what goes to them. And the analogy that's often used is, as I said before, buying a house, because once again, you have a down payment, cash in the beginning, plus debt, the mortgage that you use. And then you own the house for a while and then you sell it at the end of the period. Now that's a common analogy, but we don't think it's the best way to understand how a leverage buyout works because what happens is when you just buy a house personally, you are not earning rental income from it. But when you buy a company, you are earning not rental income, but you're earning cash flow, you're earning profits, you're earning something on that investment because you are not living there. And just like when you buy a house, if you buy a house to rent it out to other people, you buy it as an income generating asset, which you may then sell in a couple of years. So we think that's a better analogy to use to understand an LBO model and how a leverage buyout actually works. It is less confusing versus thinking of it as if you bought a house to live in personally. So we're gonna go through that analogy here and go through why and how the math behind an LBO model actually works. So the basic reason the math here works is that when you use debt to buy a house that you rent out to other people and make an income from, or you use it to buy a company which generates free cash flow, which generates after-tax profits that also goes to you if you're the 100% owner of that company, then when you use debt, you can use it to reduce the upfront purchase price. And that is the main reason why a leveraged buyout or using debt to buy real estate actually works the way it does. Think about it this way. If you invest $150 versus $500, well, it's going to be much easier to get a high return on the smaller amount invested, the 150, than it is on the 500. And certainly on a larger scale, if you have, say, $500,000 versus $10 million, well, it's going to be a lot easier to get a high return on $500,000 versus $10 million. And even on an even larger scale, once you get up to the billions or tens of billions, well, it's really hard to earn a high return on that because you have to find ideas that are not only profitable, but are also big and profitable. Whereas if you are working on a smaller scale, it's much easier to find these smaller opportunities to double your money, to triple your money, and so on and so forth. So to illustrate this, let's take a look at this example here of first buying a house with 100% cash and then using 70% debt and 30% cash to buy that same house. And let's look at what happens here. So in scenario one, we're using 100% cash. So that equates to 500 here. I haven't specified the units, but this is presumably something like $500,000. So we buy it up front for $500,000. And then the selling value, we're going to assume is $550,000. That equates to roughly... 2% increase in prices per year over this five year period that we have. And we're assuming that we get a rental income, an annual rental income of 35 here. And if you run the numbers, 35 divided by 500, that is about a 7% yield, which is roughly in line for real estate, especially residential real estate. You'll often see a yield in that range of between five and 10%. Now the debt interest rate, debt principal repayment, those don't come into play yet. Those we'll look at in our second example, but let's just go through our first example first and see what happens here. So we have a purchase of the property for 500 at the beginning. So we spend that 500 in cash and then each year we get 35 in rental income. Now we're assuming that this doesn't grow. In real life, it would probably grow by say 2%, 3%, 4% per year, but this is just for sake of this example. We get that rental income at the end in year five and then finally we sell it at the end in year five for 550. So how much have we invested? Well, we invested the 500. Now how much do we get back total? total, we got back 725. So you might look at that and think, okay, well, that seems reasonable. I mean, we get roughly 1.5x if you do the math here, as I did with the sum formula. So 1.5x, 
and the IRR, the internal rate of return, so the effective compounded interest rate on this investment is around 9%, which is pretty typical for real estate to see returns in that range because you have a 7% yield and then the exit price grows over the purchase price. So do the rough math and you can see how the internal rate of return would be slightly above the 7% yield that we calculated. So this is an okay scenario. 9% is nothing to sneeze at. It certainly beats inflation in most cases, maybe not as good as the stock market overall, but what happens if you now use leverage? So now what happens if you use 70% debt and 30% cash? So you have 150 in your down payment and then you have 350 in debt or the mortgage you use to buy this house and then rent it out to other people. Well, in this case, take a look at this. Now our purchase price gets reduced from 500 up here down to 150 down here. Now that may seem like a small difference, but that actually makes a really big difference in the model because as we'll see, it is much, much easier to get a high return on 150 than it is on 500. So what happens here? Well, we still have this rental income of 35, but we are also paying interest and we're paying debt principal each year. So that reduces our cash flow each year. That's true. But in general, if you think about these numbers and think about the way about the way this works, yes, our cash flow is down by about 25 or so each year here. However, our purchase price in the beginning is down by 350. So which do you think makes more of a difference? Reducing the purchase price by 350 or reducing our cash flows in between over these four or five years by, let's run the numbers, say five times 25. So that's a percentage, but five times 25, about 125. You can tell intuitively that reducing the purchase price by 350 is gonna make way more of a difference than reducing our cash flows by 125 because first off, money today is worth more than money tomorrow, meaning that this upfront purchase price reduction is worth more in net present value terms. And also, just numerically, 350 is bigger than 125. So you look at this and you realize why and how the math works the way it does. Now, when we go and sell the property at the end, we still sell it for 550 up here, but we also have to repay our debt. Now, how much debt do we have to repay at the end? Well, we had 350 initially, and then throughout this buyout period, we had paid off so we're down to around 306 at the end because we paid off around 45, 44 or so of this over the course of these four or five years. So we do have to repay debt here, but even after that, even taking that into account, look at this, our returns multiple here is 1.9x versus 1.5x above. So our returns multiple gets boosted by about 30% here. And then our internal rate of return goes from 9% up to 15%. So look at that, it's an increase of over 50% all because we use this debt, we use the 70% in the beginning. And the reason it works again is because reducing the purchase price has a disproportionate effect on this entire transaction structure, on this entire scenario. It makes much more of a difference than not having as much cash flow good to you in between. And it certainly makes more of a difference to reduce the purchase price in the beginning versus reducing the exit value at the end because of the time value of money. Money today is worth more than money five years from now due to inflation and the compounding effect of money. You could put it somewhere else and earn something on that money. So as a result, this means that it's almost always in your best interest when buying a company like this, if you're a private equity firm, to use as much leverage as you can reasonably use without bankrupting the company or putting it into serious financial difficulty. And as I say right here, PE firms usually aim for an IRR of around 20% or higher. So they roughly want to double what the stock market in the US has returned over the past 100 years or so. So in this case, it doesn't quite meet the threshold to be a good leveraged buyout candidate. But if they were able to increase the selling price at the end, make it go up from 550 to 600 or 650 or something else, maybe that would improve it. Maybe they can increase the yield somehow by improving the property, by increasing rent, something like that, by getting better terms on the debt, they might be able to claim more cash flow for themselves. Maybe they can increase the amount of debt that's used in the beginning from 70% to 80%. So there are a lot of ways to increase the return here, but those are some of the key factors that impact a model and also why in general leverage buyouts work. And also, as you can see here, why any type of debt used to purchase an asset such as real estate works the way it does because leverage will amplify your returns. And if you make money, it'll make, you'll make more money with leverage. If you don't make money, you'll make even less money if you use leverage. 
Now to show you another real world example of this, I'm going to go to this model for J Crew. So this is a leverage buyout completed by TPG around a $3 billion deal of this retailer J Crew Group in the US. And what I want to show you is here at the bottom how this math works, where we calculate the IRR. So let me just set up a frame quickly. So you can see here, investor equity, what we put in the beginning and then what we get back at the end. So the 1.4, 1.5 billion here, this is really just like the down payment here for the house, the 150. So this serves the same role. And we get back to the 2.6, 2.7 billion after repaying debt, as you can see here, which really serves the same role as the 244 right here. We have zeros in between. And you can see we get a return of around 12 or 13 percent. So very, very low, probably not something most PE firms would be interested in unless the assumptions are significantly different. But now let's look at what happens if we change the percent debt use. So in this case, we're using 61 percent debt. But what would happen if we change that to zero? Well, let's go down and take a look at this in the model. The return drops to 8.3 percent. So without leverage, the return falls by around 30%, probably a little bit more than 30%, going from around 12 or 13% down to about 8%. So it makes a really, really big impact on the model, even though in this case, the returns are pretty miserable to begin with. And likewise, if we change this, let's say we use 90% debt now, what would happen here? Well, in this case, the return goes up to 19%. So you can see just how big a difference leverage makes. Simply by reducing that upfront purchase price, you can increase your IRR by quite a bit. Going from 60% to 90% increases the IRR from 13% to 19%, all because of that upfront purchase price reduction. It goes from 1.4 billion down to 700 million now. So that is how and why leverage works in the context of a leverage buyout. So just to recap what we went through, that analogy that's often used to explain an LBO, which is buying a house with a down payment and a mortgage, paying off the mortgage over time, selling it at the end, not exactly the best way to understand it. It's better to think of it as a house that you buy to rent out to other people, because in both cases, buying a company and buying a house, you get rental income or cash flows that you can accumulate yourself or that you can use to repay debt with. And an LBO works mathematically because by using leverage in the beginning, you reduce that upfront cost, you use the cash flows to repay debt principal and interest. And at the end, yes, you do have to repay debt, but on balance, reducing that upfront cost by a lot outweighs by far the impact of repaying debt principal, interest, and also having a lower net proceeds amount at the end.